Welcome, everybody. We're excited to get rocking and rolling today. We're going to be talking about deal wins in the final hour, how end-of-month sales strategies are costing you millions. Have some great guests, but before we get in, I wanted to do a quick poll question. If you've got a minute, we're waiting for a couple stragglers, go ahead and answer this. I think it will help set up the conversation for today's discussion very appropriately. The question is, do you believe your end of month or quarter sales strategy is effective at maximizing revenue? Again, we're going to be talking today about what happens at the end of month and quarter. We want to understand how you feel your current strategy is doing. Interesting. As you can see, we've got some pretty interesting results. I think this will help us tee up this conversation a little bit more appropriately um, with, with our two guests today. All right, everybody, we're excited to be joined today with two special guests um, with our InsideSales.com webinar. We have founder and CEO Dave Elkington. Dave, thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Uh, and then we have a, a little bit of an unusual guest, but uh, somebody that's participated a lot with InsideSales.com, Dr. Jim Oldroyd, Professor of Strategy at Brigham Young University. Jim, thanks for joining. It's good to be here. So um, we're going to dive in, you guys, today and talk about a study that we all participated in, um, and it's around this concept of what's happening at the end of the month, quarter, or year when it comes to opportunities and deals. So without stealing the thunder, Jim, I want to turn it over to you. Can you just lay the groundwork as to what, what, what was this study? What was kind of the purpose of it? Give it us sure. kind of the big picture there. Sure. So we were really interested in looking into the question of what happens, what happens around the end of the month, end of the quarter, end of the year, and firms closing strategies. So we all know that there's a big push. One of my first experiences I had – uh, observing this, I was at GE Medical. Oh, I, was, I thought you, I was, you I was, were going to be a sales yeah, guy. You're no, not a sales I, w guy, I was right? visiting GE Medical doing a case study on them, and it happened to be the end of the quarter, and it was like mayhem as right. everyone's running around trying to find. You know, I need I need a million dollars right now. You know, it's one of the one guy who was yelling, <laughs> and it it uh, piqued my interest, and I've been interested in a long time in these uh, end of quarter, end of month, end of year closing strategies and how firms. Uh, use these to, you know, are they are they beneficial or not? So what's going on at these yeah. end of time periods? So when it comes to the study, what was some of the data that was used or or, or the analysis that was done? Yeah, so we we dug into millions of observations across two years, looking at what actually what what actually. So these are micro behavior. What actually is closed? What is lost? Basically, are the two questions we were looking at, and looking at that across the temporal period over two yeah, years. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised the 9.8 million sales transactions. Yeah. I've talked to a couple people in the industry, and it was like, hey, we do surveys, we do analysis of 100 people, of 500 people, but almost 10 million sales yeah, opportunities. Right. And really, that's what's really cool about this study is there's a lot of intuition around it. Yeah. Like people have their gut feeling. But nobody really has put together that much data to actually no look at the it, to look at the phenomenon. So, 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 so let's turn to Dave real quick. I mean, you, you obviously own your own company. Um, big picture, why is this? You know, what is happening, and why is this happening when we think of these end of time period behaviors? Well, again, I think what's interesting is Jim talks about this. Um, these are fake uh, deadlines we put in place, right? I mean, they're they're arbitrary. So some companies have calendar year ends. Um, some companies do January, some do February. So a lot of these these cadences that we put in place right. for our salespeople aren't necessarily real things. And so I think it's an interesting um, question to ask: Is it even is it even effective? Is it even is it is it productive? Like, do we get anything out of it? Um, and and I think the study is particularly interesting to, to the point you said. Um, there there's a lot of opinions around this, and and some companies are weekly cadences. Some people do do monthly cadences, some people do quarterly cadences, some do annual cadences, um, and inevitably there's this end of cadence or end of period push. Um, and I think some companies really highlight it, some, some companies don't. Frankly, interestingly, I think customers have gotten wise to this also, and so I think in many cases we've trained customers, and we'll talk more about this, but um, we've trained customers to abuse these time frames. Well, and actually, let's go into it right now. I do want to get into some of the, the detail and some of the findings, but we think of, we all know this intuitively. You mentioned that, Jim. Yeah. It happens at the end of the month or quarter year. 
who is to blame? Uh, you know, Dave, you just brought up customers that maybe we've trained. Is it the sales rep? Is it the sales manager? Is it the customer? I'd love to hear each of your opinions. Maybe, Dave, yeah. you could start. I mean, e even think about it in the, the consumer space, right? When we're trying to buy a car, yeah, I mean, are. there's rumors of like, hey, go on a rainy day. Go at the end of the month when they're trying to hit their numbers. Like, I just bought a car, and, and I totally did the end of the on month. A, right? I mean, and we do that. And Nailed so it. Here, here's why. There's... Um, we know there's there's desperation for a sales guy. They're trying to hit their numbers. They're trying to go to their sales club. They're trying to do whatever, and we want to take advantage of that. Yeah. And so as a consumer, um, we're going to do whatever we got to do to get the best possible deal we can. Now, depending on your industry, a, bit, you know, a, a good deal represents something else from, you know, a, a good deal means something very different to different people. But at the end of the day, whatever whatever behavior we want out of customers, let me let me say it a different way. However we incentivize customers for better deals, they'll act that way. So well, and I'll argue, however we incentivize sales reps, they're going to act the exact same way. That's exactly so right. So this is a cascading effect. I and mean, we've been talking about the customer problem, but I don't even think that's the biggest problem. I think the bigger problem is we've incentivized sales reps, and they know it's about deal flow. And so they're going to, you know, and the data shows they, they're willing to give away huge concessions on that last day to try to get stuff to close so they can push it into whatever the temporal I mean, period I, you is. You guys are probably in the same boat as me. I have literally heard sales reps say things oh, like, yeah. hey, wait a couple more weeks and I'll get you I'll give you a better deal. deal. I, I, mean, I can get a better deal from my manager, yeah. right? So, uh, but, and here, here's why. Um, we as sales leaders create this behavior. What we do is we put incentives or accelerators in place. So we say, look, um, the more you get done in this temporal period, in this time frame, um, I'm going to actually pay you a higher commission or a higher spiff or a higher incentive. I've seen it. And, and so um, what reps will do is they will deliberately, they'll tell a customer, say, look, um, I'm trying to get this thing done. Don't buy it till the end of the month. If they already know they've missed their month or their quarter, they're actually going to push deals into the next quarter because they've already yeah. tanked it. So they're like, look, don't buy this month. Buy next quarter. <laughs> so there's a lot of bad behavior um, that we create by making these temporal time frames and these incentives around them. But I, I want to emphasize, so I think... So we went looking for what happens at the end of the month, and we weren't looking for wins or losses. We were just saying what happens. Right. The thing that's really cool about this study is it, it shows that I get three times, almost 2.9 times as many deal close on that last day of the month. So you're, everyone out there is saying my intuition is we get more deal flow on the end of the month. Because that would be the case. If I went and spoke to a sales leader, he would say or she and, would say. And they are correct. And it's right. They're getting 2.9 times lift on that last day of the month with all that energy and effort and that, you know, people going crazy trying to get the deals. It works. But what they have not looked at, which we looked at for the first time, is how many deals are they losing? And they're losing almost 12, 12 times as many deals. 1,200% more deals. Yeah. So, right. so if I'm gaining three, I'm losing 12. Right? And so and if I went, to a, I went to any sales leader and I said, look, are you willing to have your sales reps lose four or five deals for every one they make just so that we can accelerate things into that last day of the month. And they would for sure say there's no way. So, so I do want to ask. Oh, yeah. Now, now there's there's a phenomena there. I'm going to challenge you a little bit. Okay. Um, sometimes reps will also carry deals that they know are non-deals. And they're going to drag that to the end of the month. And they know if that goes into their next month or their next quarter or their next year, they're going to be held accountable. And so some of that's just cleaning, cleaning pipes. So I will, I will disagree with you, and here's why. So I'm, I'm looking <laughs> hold at – Hold it down, we, Hold it down. We looked at win and loss across every day in yeah. the month. Yeah. And the, the win and loss rates are pretty consistent throughout. Yeah. So I, I'm agreeing that I for sure there, – there are people cleaning their pipe. They clean it throughout the whole month. They, they close deals throughout the whole month. And – so, but having a four or five times as big a loss, the scale so, is huge. The so, scale is significant. So, very, it very well may be that I'm just saying, oh, it's not going to. I'm, I'm not going to get the deal. But here's my question: What would have happened if I didn't have the incentive to push that hard that they, in effect, they fired me as a potential, you know, they, Risk. they, yeah, they yeah. just said I'm done with you. What if I was able to just keep farming that? So I'm, in other words, as you ta as you started this, we're talking about I'm enforcing a temporal pacing on this on the uh, sales process that is arbitrary and completely made up by me, and that often does not fit what a, a customer. But does. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge um, customers and sales reps need forcing events. They need events that that are gonna force. Think about it this way, um, and I think in larger enterprises it's even more pronounced. 
but a customer is someone who's in a large organization and they're trying to get a deal done and they need something to go to their boss to say, if I get it done by this, we get a deal. I can get event. it done. It's right. a compelling event of some kind. I've, and so whether that's... And maybe, all, all I'm saying is this. Almost everyone is attention constrained. And by me forcing everything to fall on that last day of the month, it's a, it's a $100 million cost to your company. That's what the data shows. It's about a hundred well, million I th dollar I cost. This is an interesting. I think this is one of the ways, and we, I want to get into how to solve this. But yeah. you know, by forcing it into this time-based compelling event, we potentially put ourselves in a bad place. If we create a different type of event that is maybe ma based on more value or something like that, we may see the numbers change slightly. So I want to get into that in a minute, well, but continue. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please. I was going to say, but let, let's look at some of the other data because yeah, I think it actually makes it interesting. Uh, there, there's more to this story. So. Well, in fact, there's one I love, and I'd love your comment on it. Um, it's not just that the 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 lose rates or the loss rates are much higher. Um, the deal sizes are smaller, and and, and the that's combination the combination. Well, the and that's why weird. I don't believe that it's firing my potential deals because yeah. the deal size wouldn't change. What we see is the second to last day of the period versus the last day of the period. There's a dramatic decrease in deal size, and that's because people are giving stuff away. Right. I'm like, you know, it's it's uh, it's like you said, Gabe. I just went and bought a car. I go last day of the month, and they're going to give me the maximum discount. And so it, it, these temporal effects are incentivizing bad behavior all the way around, suboptimal behavior all the way well, around. Now, now there, there's a, a couple other things, too. And if you just think from the perspective of a buyer, um, most of this stuff makes sense. So from a buyer's perspective, again, think about you when you're buying a car. I, I'm trying to maximize the deal I can get. So I'm going to wait to the end of the month. Um, but if a seller, there's some of the other data, and I, I want you to, to talk to it. If you try and get a deal closed on a weekend versus a weekday, we're seeing deal rates decline, deal sizes decline. If you're trying to do it on a Monday, so, Friday versus midday, similar trends. So this is a really good point because this is baked into almost every single company, every single deal, deal process. And so if you try to buck against this, I mean, if I, go to a, if I went to a car dealer and said, it's the end of the month, give me a deal, and they looked at me and said, we don't do that, I would be confused. Right. Right? I'd be well, like, or you wouldn't believe it. You'd yeah. Be like, you're just lying like, to yeah, me. you're lying. Everyone yeah. does this. Yeah. But you have companies like CarMax who, who, from the day one, they said, we don't do that. And so it's you believe price. them, right? Yeah. They say, we, we don't play those games. It's right here. Yeah. You know, and there, there's other ways you could think about this. You know, there's... What if on the first day of the month it was the best deal and the price went up over the month, right? I mean, so then, in other words, instead of starting high and coming down, what if we started low and went high? I mean, there's lots of ways we could think about Doing changing the psychology of people so that it, both for our reps and for customers. And, and at the end of the day, we're, it's a two-pronged problem. We have to change customers' perspective. We also have to change sales reps' perspective. So I do want to make sure that the audience has kind of these three numbers in their head because I think it's kind of important, maybe four numbers. So one, you said last day of the month, we, we win deals almost 3x more, but we lose deals almost 12x more. That's right? right. Number two, because of that, we see this win rate decrease. On the last day of the month, the, the win rate is basically decreasing by 51%. That's right. In addition to that, deal sizes then drop 34%. And then to Dave's point, that compounding effect says, hey, weekday win rates versus weekend win rates, you see a difference of 72%. So I, had, huge. I had a sales leader actually tell me, you know, we often will bring pizza in s Saturday or Sunday at the last day of the month. Try to get people and there. And you got this almost compounded influence. So those are the four key numbers. I mean, as a sales leader, what's the thing that jumps out to you the most? Is it the deal size? Is it the win rate? Or is it just this compounding? It's of, oh the compounding goodness. effect. Now, the, the, the problem, though, is if you're faced at the end of the month and you've not closed the deals you need to do, and it's it's a weekend, you're, you're, it's not like you're going to say, okay, everybody go home. you still got to get the deal. That's right. So I, mean, so the, I think is a, a, a lot of the listeners are going to say, well, okay, what, what am I great. To do? Yeah, great. Do you want me to stop selling? And that, that's yeah. not the an, it's not the answer. In fact, I think we're going to talk through some of that. Um, but a, again, think think about some of the the th other pieces of data. We actually found that the highest win rate and the largest deal sizes are three to four days before the end of the month or before the end of the quarter or before the end of the year. Which which means, and if you look at a chart, it, it starts at the beginning of the month pretty low, right. and then it slowly in, you know increases until you get to that. You know, call it three to four days before the end of the period, and then it just drops. It just, it just no, drops. So, so we actually get a hockey stick up, right? So right. What, to your point, I think 
these events are necessary because they they focus our attention and energy and effort on getting deals done. Right. That's absolutely necessary. And then that last day is when we fall off the cliff yeah. and do really stupid but things. But I, I like, and you both have talked about this before, that there there becomes this, and this is getting a little more into the solution, right? I want to pivot here and maybe talk a little about how we start to solve some of these challenges. But um, there is some kind of optimal window that maybe companies should be thinking about that optimizes their own deal sizes in win rates. Now, we did a study with, you know, 10 million opportunities across two and a half years of data, but this is an average. If I start to think about how to solve some of these challenges, is there a way that I can figure out how this looks in my own organization? Well, yeah, absolutely, but the first thing to know is what's, what's, the, what's the prize? If you figure this out, like what is it worth to you? And, and the, the number is roughly 27%. So you'll do 27% 20, more yeah. revenue if you can manage your your closing timing, your clo closing cadence, I mean, which what, is what huge. Leader, it's you know, huge. I mean, I've visited a tons of clients, and I think every sales leader always can't hit their number. You right. Know? I mean, can't hit, hit their quota. Can't uh, hit their number. Twenty seven percent. If you can flip your switch and get a twenty percent increase, who wouldn't do it? I was at a at a, a dinner two nights ago um, in in Atlanta, and we had Sales Benchmark Index, yeah, one of yeah. the the leaders SBI, in the yeah, SBI, yep. um, and they shared the average um, job tenure for a sales leader is less than two years. Yeah. Think about that, and why is it? Because they miss their number. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and on average, they miss their number roughly by 30%. I mean, if someone- So what, would, think about what I just yeah. said. Think about what I just said. I can't believe it. Leaders miss their numbers on average by 30%. This we we, we know where, we know where this, that number is. You fix this, you keep your job. So I guess, what's the prize here? The prize is actually you know hitting, hitting, keeping your job and ultimately hitting your number. Um, and, and the key to what is, is what you just said. It's planning. Like you can't do it the way you've been doing it before. And, and the other risk, so when I say planning, you can't wait to the end of the month and say, guys, we're not gonna do this. We're gonna, yeah. we're gonna buck yeah. the trend. We're not closing today. Like you can't do that. <laughs> what you have and to do- you get fired if you did that as yeah. well. Yeah, you get, and so it's like a lose-lose. You have to think way ahead of time. Yeah. This is about training. This is about education. This is about changing incentives. Can, so, changing. And I think the first point is understanding. The reality is, is if I went to a sales organization, I said, show me your lift at the end of the month, they could show it to me. No. But if I said, show me your loss, they would be like, what are you talking about? Right. And, well, I don't think it's on any leader's mind, right? I mean, if you said, how can you boost revenue by sale yeah. by 30%, yeah. this has got to be nowhere on let me take the, Let me take that 12 times, you know, the 12 deals that you're losing in the end of the month and let me keep half of those. Right. That turns out to be a, a pretty well, significant and, and number. And let's be honest. The way to do that then is to manage those closing, closing cadences so where you're, you're actually having that conversation you know, a week before the end of the month, not at the end of the well, month. I think there are so many different options. Yeah, I mean, there's a million ways well, let, when we I get in. Hear, I'd love to see if we can't get down to the top three, the top five ways that leaders can start to capitalize, make this change and capitalize on this improvement. So, Gabe, let me again interrupt. The most important thing, I think, for the takeaway from this is if you don't understand your uh, sales process, yeah. you can't fix it. You can't yeah. manage it. You, you don't know what you're doing. And so unless you have tools to help you understand your pipeline, so number one, understand it, understand that this is even potentially a problem in your own organization. Well, and, and I would go a step further. You take results from a study like this and you're going to get general best practices. Sure. So what the first thing you got to do, and I think Jim's exactly right. This is the one time where, you know, we agree with each other. <laughs> um, no yeah. Um, you you got to go look at your data. Yeah. Because, just because it's 27 percent across you know, nine million records. Right. What is it in your company? Like, what, do you sell in the healthcare industry? Do you sell million dollar deals? Do you sell thirty million dollar deals, or do you sell ten thousand dollar deals? Well, and so we cut into that a little bit, and it's surprisingly consistent. So, a, a lot of studies we do, we see very high variance right. across. In this study, everybody's so, there. Well, but I, I, I mean, there is variance, and if I understand, look, what if it's killing me forty percent rather than thirty percent, or, or, or uh, what if it's not? three or four days before the end of the quarter? What if it's the That's second? Right. What if That's my right. best closing day is the beginning of the quarter? Yeah. So, like, well, and then why? Right. Like why is that? I mean, the reality is, is we all, we, we have intuition around why it's falling off at the end of the month. It's because salespeople put too much pressure on clients and they say, I'm done and walk away. Right. We've, we've been, all been there ourselves. But what if, what if their pressure was applied, but just not quite as severe? And then a week later I said, you know, let's, let's do this deal. And, right? and so again, step one, 
learn the general trends. Look at the, the, the research study, download it, like understand it, internalize it, get the infographic, put it up on your wall, whatever. Yeah. Step two, go analyze your data. Understand your go data. Go understand your data. Look at what your win rates are, your close rates, or your, your loss rates. Look at your, like, one thing your is deal si- your deal size by day of period. By, by the way, if you don't know how to do that, email me and I can help you figure that right. out. It's I mean, not very sophisticated. I mean, Inside sales. We s- it. We well, that's what I'm saying. So our HDF product helps you with like there's yeah. there's ways to so do this. They've got tools. People have tools. Like yeah. it's, you can do it in a spreadsheet. Like this is but, not but rocket science. They're not doing it. They're not doing it. So but so that's do it. So you are suggesting that we could find our optimal time of month or quarter yes. where we have the best win rates and optimal deal sizes. Well, and uh, yes, and I would argue that that changes um, on a Couple. monthly and a quarterly basis. It's sure. seasonal, right? So in the summer, it's going to be different than it is it's in the winter. It's also sales rep dependent. I mean, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of so, nuance so, so in this. So Learn your that. data. So, so if, if I have that and I know this data, yes. I know where my optimal times are, what can I now do with that data? So, the, the sec, so this is number three. So number one, learn the general results. You know, apply the study. Number two, look at your data. Number three, um, go build an optimal closing cadence. Like say, yeah. for our company and for this rep, Right. Um, go build, like right. go Get give specific. them the target. Like reps will do what they need, what they need to do to win. They want to make money. They want to be successful. The third, the fourth thing I would do then is I would actually go create incentives for the reps. Like go now motivate them well, to behave the and, right and, way. And that we can actually test. We ran this this summer with our right. sales operations team here at InsideSales.com. We found our optimal time to buy. Um, or sell, you know, our win rates were optimal. And then we put some incentives to close at about the 17th of July. That was happened to be the incentive. So you can actually align some you can, incentives you can change around behavior. where your well, optimal closing And happens. one of the biggest problems I see is sales reps are often incentivized based on just give me a number. Give me, I, I want volume. Give me 2 million, right. give me 3 million, give me sure. 10 million. There's no profitability number there. And so that's why we see them cutting price at the end of the month because, dang, I don't care if the company loses 30%. For me, it's a win. That's right. So if you get numbers, aligning interest, yeah, make just sure make incentives align interest. Well, and what if your number was profitability instead of overall flow? You know, overall yeah, volume. I mean, this is an interesting question for the SaaS world. Yeah. I've not come across a SaaS compensation plan that is based on profit rather than AR. I mean, well, any here, here's why. Yeah, on? I mean, here's the reason why. It's why give pro- in reality, that's not their job. It's your job as, a, as a, an executive of a company mm. to figure out how to be profitable. Um, but at the same time, it's also your job to make sure that everybody in your company are, are aligned. Well, see, right? and, and I'll disagree. I think it's every employee's job. That's okay. Job, you can be wrong. <laughs> every employee's job to drive profitability. Yeah. And if they're not adding value, if, if they... But you don't see it in SaaS as often. But you see do, it in, in where you have a hard But we see it everywhere. Because but, but, the reality is they don't realize that by me discounting, I'm cut. As, I don't but think they realize See, that. that's not the employee's job. The employee's job is to be... Push um, the deal. To, yeah, the to deal push the deal. It's my job to make sure that they're incentivized to do that. So I got to make sure that their comp... Uh, accommodates maybe gross margin. I need to make sure their comp accommodates discount rates. That's fair enough. Right. As long as I think this it's one number is a problem. In the, and compensation's always because tricky. If you're really yeah. dropping deal no, size by 34, 35%, I mean, something yeah. you don't care about profit margin. That You're not aligned, I think, to the, today's point. Well, so some conversation needs to happen. And, and let's be honest. Um, every software company prices discounts into their price. <laughs> like they anticipate it. I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you, I've consulted. More companies than I want to share. I'm, I'm just going to be candid. Like, they mark up their price. So that and, they and can automatically. Everyone they, knows it's there. Right. I mean, at the, at the car dealership. I, I mean, I can go online right, and right, find what invoice is, what MSRP is. Like, it's public. But every software company has. And I'm not going to tell you what it is because I know what <laughs> the average <laughs> discount. I'm not going to tell you what it is because people use it against us. Um, but it's there. And so, the, I guess... You need a, you just need a plan. Yeah. You need to make sure, like every every sales rep has a discount that they're allowed to do, though that gets broken by the end of the month. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things Jim's talking about that fixes but, this. Behavior. But I also think it would be interesting to play around with the temporal pacing because it doesn't have anything to do with the customer. Like the reality is, is as a customer, like I have pressure. I, I need incentive and pressures to buy, but. But why are those time-based well, okay. incentives? Okay, so let's challenge that for a second. Because um, we, we, we debated this before. Well, what if we say, okay, if we know that four days before the end of the month is, is on average the optimal but closing time. But that's optimal under your temporal 
period. The, the data here is looking at companies who I think are broken in their sales process. Okay, so that's everybody. Yeah. Right, exactly. that's because completely this data it's 10 million. Represents, 10 million. This data represents the largest companies in the world. That's right. I, well, clearly, by the deal size, I can tell you they're very large companies. Yeah. Average deal size is about $360 million. So we're talking huge companies. Average revenue. Excuse revenue. Me. Yeah. Average revenue. revenue. So Sorry. these are these, uh, clearly. Say, the, that's a big deal <laughs> size. But, but, oh. but then even shame on us, nice. even, oh. even more shame on us. The, the, I mean, so now we're talking, I'm talking the world's best companies, and I'm saying you've never even thought about your loss. I mean, that, to me, that's like, but sometimes it's a crime. companies are the most broken. Well, well whatever. And, but and, what and I'm you, saying, though, is, is I, the, I think f there's a fundamental issue here, which is the, the incentives and the temporal pacing, as you say, are, are necessary to drive behavior. Action. To drive behavior, drive action, both on customers and reps. But I'm there's saying the, the, the breadth of our th deep thinking about this issue is so shallow, it's well, scary. Let's, let's, let's be honest, though. The sales world has is, is been what it's been for ye hundreds of years, right? Hundreds of years. And these processes aren't five years old. I mean, there's, they're, 100, they're 200 years old. And so what you're saying, I mean, you're basically trying to buck the trend. Look, they, of, they would bleed patients for 200 years. Like the doctors would bleed their patients right. because right. that's what but, they did. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's broken system. I think that there's there, that that with better visibility, with deeper understanding, well, no, I, we can understand and modify, and then build our understanding off of a deeper understanding and take well, okay. us to, to, so to gonna, a much better so place. So let's let's challenge this. In do we take the Carmax strategy? Do companies say, look, we're going to just we're going to remove that discount rate, and no uh, matter what, there's no, no matter discount. what, there's no discount. Is is this is our price. Um, and come buy from us whenever you, I'm going to do the Nordstrom's thing. I'm not going to pay my reps, uh, commission. Yeah. Like, I, there's no pressure for sales. The, the is that what you were, is that where you No, were? that's one, that's what I'm one, saying I, is, what I'm saying, about. what I'm saying is. It doesn't work though. Is, I'll just challenge that, that doesn't work. But then you think it, deeper about it. You're saying that would be I, And I'm option. saying, I'm saying, I, I don't know that we can answer every company out there what their correct, correct. strategy should yeah. be. But I can tell you, I can it's tell them their they have not been thinking about it deeply enough. enough. The fact that the industry norm is so broken. Well, well and I think one thing, you guys, that could help people... Keep bleeding the patients. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a great it's, analogy. It's, you know. I mean, wow. It's a good mental picture. A um, little bit of leeches among friends. Yeah, that's right. anything. we got to start wrapping up here, but I wanted to get to the visibility. And, and I don't want to go too far into the product pitch here, but it's just necessary because part of the problem is, is a sales team or a sales leader... I get to that last day of the month and I look at every deal possible and I say, let's pull every single one of them. Where if I had something to allow me to say, you know what, truthfully, these 10 or these 25 out of the 50 have way higher likelihood of bringing it in and I'll get 6 million yeah. instead of if I tried for everyone getting 7 million. I'm just going to focus. So, Is there a way I can do okay. that? Can you so, talk about yeah. So let me talk about it in the general and you talk about it in the you specific. Got it. You got for it. me, this is what is exciting happening in industry right now is where you are finally to the point where we're actually looking at data that makes a difference. Yeah. We're looking at the individual rep behavior data. We're looking at the individual customer data and we're thinking about it in a way that we've never done before. And that's going to add a ton of value to organizations, like just being able to scientifically approach the problem. So, all right, and I'll be more specific. What's what's interesting is this is such a huge problem. And, and, and l let me be more specific. The ability to look into a forecast and even know what's going to close and what's not going to close is so not broken. Existent. Here are the numbers. On average, um, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll disclose, this was such a problem as we were looking at the industry and looking internally at our own selling cadence. Um, we saw it such a gap. We went actually looked out, found a company who does this amazingly well, and we bought them. Um, and we've actually turned it into a product. Right, right. Um, and, and the data in it is amazing. So um, well, let me tell you what this company does, um, and now we do. It's our HDF product. It's our high-definition forecasting product. But um, it uses all of these micro behaviors that, that Jim talks about that are in the study, and, um, and it, it uses machine learning and predictive analytics to go and identify deals that are more likely to close or not likely to close um, and, do, and actually do it algorithmically, do it mathematically. And here are some of the numbers that'll, that'll shock you 20 percent of uh, at the beginning of a period quarter year um month one out of five deals that the sales rep said they were going to close do close 20 percent it's one out of five yeah. i mean my, my daughter That's less my daughter can pick better than that like a monkey can pick better than that in many <laughs> cases right it's, it's really bad um mathematically 
it's typically about an 80%, like using an algorithm like what, what our, our solution does, you have an 80% accuracy rate. So what, what you do with that though is, and, and by the way, so how do they make up the difference? Because reps don't do 20%. What they do is they, they make a call of call it 5 million and they get a million of it from the ones that they actually thought they were going to do. And then right. they're going to find, they're going to so make up the difference. They're going to go work hard. Deals. And they're going to work hard. They're going to get, they're going to pull deals forward. And that totally precisely true. is when you upset the customer and why we're seeing the 12 X loss in, that's, in no, that's, deals. Exactly. That, that's the problem. And, and it's because they don't know what deals are going to close. And so the first thing that technology and whether you use our technology or somebody else's, or you frankly have a spreadsheet that helps you get there. Um, the trick is you got to know what deals are going to close and not going to close. And then you put all of your focus in those and all of your effort. And what you'll often find is um, marketing and sales have come up short. So if, if a guy's quota for the year is call it, you know, 30 million and you go look at the, the data and the data says, look, there's only support for 12 million. Um, what reps do is they just jam their pipe with other things that might close. And frankly, sometimes do close. Right. And so it's not I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing. But what you need to do is you need to know of these 12 million that well, we imagine this though, Dave, imagine if rather, so they're writing down those, let's say five deals at the yeah. beginning and they're going to close one of them. Right. Imagine if they knew which one they were going to close and they put all the effort on that. Yeah. And then they, they, they didn't spend all their time and energy on those other 80% that, so that they that could go out. aren't going to close in period or aren't going to close at all. Exa well, yeah. And anyway, there's just so much ability to more hone your effort, yeah, prioritize to, your effort. And I'll argue again, attention is the scarce resource of our day and age. And because of that, it's your rep's attention that is that that is worth the money. I love that's it. that's I, what you're buying. I, I love it. So let's wrap up here. I know our time's short. So um, we'll do quick closing arguments and wrap up. Jim, <laughs> um, I know that's been a little bit of a bout here. Yeah. W words to an audience or as people are just learning about this the first time, how would you kind of leave them? What would you leave them thinking about? So uh, the scientific revolution is important, and it's oh, finally happening in cells. I mean, literally, like, you know, we've talked about the scientific revolution, and we, we act as if that was uh, a couple hundred years ago. Right. The reality is, is we're living through the scientific revolution yeah. right now I, in I cells, agree. and it's about time. Yeah, it's about time. I love it, man. I, I'd be a little more tactical, right? The thing I would say is... Um, Go back to your be, steps. Be an agent of change, yeah. right? Know that you're probably broken. If you're like everybody else... Um, your forecasting process, your closing process, um, it's fundamentally flawed and fundamentally broken, which means, first of all, use the research. It's free. Download it. Learn from it. Number two, learn about your closing data, your closing cadence. Like Jim said, go like dig in. Three, align incentives, align timing. Like Go do stuff that makes it better. And I mean, it's like I said, the, the prize for this is big. It's, it's, you know, maybe it's your job. <laughs> That's probably the best way to end. So with that, uh, everybody, do go check this out. You'll find it at insidesales.com slash research. It's called Time-Based Closing, the High Cost of Procrastination. So, Jim, Dave, thanks so much for joining. And everybody else, let's get Let's go it. ahead and dive let's... into some Q&A here. Um, such an interesting topic. Glad we were able to have um, Dave Elkington and Dr. Oldroyd join us. But we want to dive into this. So go ahead and submit your questions. I know we've been answering some of those during the session, but we want to get some, um, some now. While you're doing that, I want to go to another poll question. And this one goes more into what you're doing currently in your company to solve or you know, what, what are you doing to solve some of these challenges? So the question is, what strategies has your companies used to solve the end of month or quarter dilemma discussed in today's webinar. And you can see multiple options. Feel free to use the other down there at the bottom. Um, we're interested to know, for those of you who have this problem, if you played with comp plans, if you um, use predictive forecasting technology to really understand what deals can be pushed or pulled more effectively. So go ahead and answer that. I'll give you just a couple seconds, and then we'll review um, those answers and then and then add some of these, uh, these other Q&A that we've got here. Um, coming into the Q&A box. All right, so you're probably seeing some of the answers now. Um, let me just scroll through these. Uh, um, it looks like build a closed plan, kind of dominated, practice the value-based selling. Oh, the focus on weekly forecast. That probably is one of the more effective um, one interesting well um appreciate that let's get into some q a rick i hope you're still out there 
Um, Rick had a fantastic question. Rick, let me know if you are still out there because I want to discuss this a little bit. Um, just put, put in the, the, the chat box that you're still there. Um, so Rick and I were chatting. Rick, your first question was, you know, he says, look, you're discussing solution based on incentives to the sales organization, but what about retraining the customer base who we've conditioned to wait until the end of the month or quarter? Now, my response to that, Rick, was um, – I still think you've got to start it with the rep and the sales manager. Now, if you can change reps, then I think you can you can change customers. But then Rick kind of came back and said, hey, hold on a minute. Um, and it looks like, Rick, you can add to this. But, hey, that only works um, if the other options that the customer has are using the same philosophy for sales, and they're not actually discounting at the end of the month or period. So my thought on that, Rick, is – this is where the retraining comes in, right? So if we go, if we create a close plan that is based on the customer's timeline and not some artificial end of the month, and we insert and we, we infuse into that this concept of value, we create an artificial timeline. We, we create an artificial need to close a deal. They've got their own timeline. We're giving them value, and all of a sudden we've hopefully kind of eliminated the need to push people, myself or other vendors, towards that end of month. Now, again, is that a bulletproof plan? I would probably argue that it's not 100%, but we've got to create other urgency triggers. We've got to get away from this end of month and get on something that's urgent for them. And will it work every time? I don't think so. But again, I think we've got to try a couple other strategies. Now, um, Rick had one more question, you know, uh, and actually multiple people, Rick, so I'm glad you asked this. This is like a quick conversation between Rick and I here. Um, but he says, hey, Gabe, look, a key challenge exists for publicly traded companies who are pressured to meet the number for the market. How do you fix that? I mean, that's the, I mean, that is it. For public traded companies, it's not that reps are trying to procrastinate or managers are just trying to be punked. It's coming all the way from the top that we have got to hit these quarterly performance numbers as we report them to the street. The question that I've been pushing back to leaders, Rick, is I've been saying 27%. I mean, what if, and truthfully, we, got, we had a couple hundred companies participate in this study, the average amount of revenue that they're leaving on the table is 27% uh, potential increase in revenue. So are you willing to um, miss something slightly for the quarter to, to – you know, increase it tenfold for the next quarter. Can you not have a short-term game and look at a long-term game? Is there a way to find the balance? And what we've been talking with senior leaders about doing is saying, okay, when that end of quarter comes, we, we, we just have to be a little bit smarter. I have 100 deals. Normally, we try to pull every single one of them in to meet that, that quarterly number. Um, and truthfully, not all of them close, as we find out. Is there a way to say out of those 100 deals, 50 of them are more likely, and we think we can get more money if we focus on those 50. We got predictive forecasting tools. These ones are more likely to close. We double down on those 50, allowing the other 50 to move to the next quarter where they would naturally close, and we get a win-win situation where we get potentially really close to our quarter number, but we also maximize our revenue. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, what are we supposed to do, Rick? We got, you're losing 27% revenue by following your bad behaviors at the end of the quarter. That also isn't okay. So there's got to be a balance. I'd love to hear your feedback on, on my nonsensical rants right there. Um, let's go to a couple others. Eric, if you're still there, is the data influenced by the size of deal and or sales type, uh, cycle time, which, it, which are often related? Oh, my goodness. You nailed it, uh, Eric. Um, it is actually, and this is why we're really encouraging people to run their own time-based closing strategies report on your own data. Um, and you'll see this in the report. I don't know which page it's on. If you've not looked at the report, we actually broke it down by um, deal size. So we went with just deal size and we said, do behaviors change if I'm closing deals that are between zero and 5,000 or five to 15,000, et cetera? The general trend was um, the following. The bigger the deal size, your, the better your win rates as you approach the end of the month or quarter. So two interesting things there. One is 
there is such thing as an optimal time for your company to close deals. It, I've seen it now since the studies come out. We've run it on at least a dozen companies. There's always a time where your company will close deals better than other companies. Um, secondly, because of this concept, if you know it, you can then restructure a lot of your incentives or or pushes to maximize around that time frame in order to maximize your revenue. So absolutely, um, this story changes slightly depending on um, the size of company you are. But again, it always, that last day of the month, no matter what, is going to be terrible across the board. But you're going to see a couple interesting things based on based on deal size. Um, let's see. Um, Rick's coming back at me here. Um, uh, what will be the new incentive for the customer to adopt this new methodology away from the end of the period? Yeah, I think the only incentive um, is value. And, and I know, I mean, I just wrote this LinkedIn article kind of mocking, you know, trendy terms, but um, value-based selling. I mean, can you get it away from price and can you get it to value? It's uh, it's always easier said than done, but um, I, I look, I've been on the phone. I, I, I mentioned it in the web. I've been on the phone with sales reps that said, hey, if you wait a couple weeks, I can get you a better deal. Um, customers who basically push it and, you know, say, hey, I'm going to wait till the end of the month or quarter to get that better deal. Um, you got to change that conversation from, hey, I can get you a better deal in the next couple months to, hey, if we're able to close this deal and get going, we can get you two times the revenue in 60 days that you're currently doing. Time's money here. There's an urgency factor. So that's, I can think, the only the, the only – you've got to change it to, to, to value on the customer side. Um, so, Eric, you say, what what is the point of qualifying? If you can, um, give, me a, give me a little more of a, an, an indication as to what you mean on that. I'd love to dive into it, but I'm thinking qualifying the deal, qualifying the opportunity. A um, couple other questions here. Oh, who was it that asked the, the, incent, the how do you incentivize – um, I, I, I didn't save it. Um, so somebody asked, can you give us a sample incentive plan of kind of changing the way people do things at the end of the month? Um, I actually do have one, you know, that we actually tested here with our mid-market team. We found we were closing deals. Our optimal win time was around the 17th of the month. So um, we actually ran uh, just a little bit of a spiff. And if you want to send send me, you know, grab me on LinkedIn, I'll give you the quick sample, nothing too fancy. We basically just said, hey, look, um, you know, you're going to get a, in this case, we said $300 extra commission for each deal closed by um, the 17th of the month. And um, we noticed a little bit of a blurb. We didn't communicate that, obviously, to customers. Um, reps didn't communicate that, that to customers, so we didn't see that artificial timeline automatically pop up. We were just trying to get reps to push, obviously, to close around our optimal time rather than our, our non-optimal time. So Eric's come back and he said, qualifying is all about aligning the customer's problem and scale of the impact with the sales effort. So, um, you know, the, th the thing is, so if, if I'm understanding you right, Eric, the problem is, and I think Rick was hitting on this, this is becoming a conversation between me, Rick, and Eric. So I got no. I got a few other questions, Angela. We got a few other people writing in. Um, I think the problem is there. I mean, if you do actually do good qualifying and you understand some of these needs, um, you're still going to run into that end of month, end of quarter. You've got to see if you can find a way to stick on that path and force the customer to come up with their own timeline, within which you can bring value to. I think those are two. Two pretty important, pretty important points. Um, so let's see. So we got here to your last point. If we've sold the customer on value, they want to buy, and we'll do it quickly. Our only path to accomplish that is from qualifying how big their problem is and how big an impact is. So we're on the same page, Eric. It's, it's, you've got to get that qualification to nail down. And truthfully, you guys, qualification isn't enough. Um, I don't know where you, you know, we at InsideSales.com, we run this motion called a blueprint or a value assessment. 
and think of it as a um, discovery or a needs analysis on steroids where we actually, free of charge, um, visualize their pain. You know, we'll do a basic discovery, but then we'll go on site, we'll spend a day with them and really understand their problems, come up with a transformational plan that highlights their, we, we show it to them, we visualize it, we, we put numbers behind it. That, Eric, keeps people focused on value. So I think it starts with qualification, but I don't think your typical 15-minute needs audit is cutting it in these instances. Um, so at one company I worked at, they provided a bonus if you achieved your quota by the midpoint of the quarter. The company was quarterly focused. Yeah. So um, I, I, these types of things are interesting, and I would recommend some people try them, um, playing with some compliance. Because seriously, I've, now that this study's come out, you guys, I've, I've talked with at least a dozen leaders who have been like, oh, my goodness. I give pizza to my reps, my inside sales team, to come in on the weekends when it's the last day of the quarter. Um, and, and you're right, Gabe. I mean, we just give away the farm to close deals on that day. Um, I've, I've had um, sales leaders say, yeah, we do end last day of the month spiffs or bonuses. You know, if you can bring it in the last day, we'll give you extra money. So just flipping that, um, Rick, and saying, hey, let's do a mid-month or, again, aligning it around your optimal win rates, um, I think can start to change the behavior. But, again, you got to think about this. Whenever you create artificial time-based closing events that are based on you and not the customer, you're going to retrain the customer. So if you run an incentive every quarter to do that, well, guess what? I'm going to probably, as a sales rep, start to say, hey, customer, if you close in the next two weeks, I can get you a better deal. So you've got to watch out for those artificial notions. We've, we've seen some of that already happen. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Always be closing, right? That's the idea, uh, Eric. Always be closing. So um, here's an interesting one. Building a clear closing cadence has worked a ton for us. Example, would be pushing for the next meeting this week and not next. It's a bunch of small changes that end up helping push the deal to be ready to close sooner and not pushing into the next week or last quarter. It's not 100%, but it's made a large improvement. I, I just wanted to read that. I wish these stupid platforms allowed you to talk to these people. Sorry, you guys, I'm looking at my marketing person rather than looking at you. But I, I'm 100% in agreement on that, Eric. The thing that we're finding just kind of tips the scale a little bit more is um, build your closing plan around your optimal closing timeframes. So, again, run this study on your own data and find, like we did, that the 17th of the, the month, again, this was for one particular team, our small market team, um, you know, that was their optimal time to close. So we tried to build our closing plans around that so that we maximize the customer timelines and ours. That's a, it's an interesting kind of cherry on top to your typical close plan here. I love the idea of, you know, Glenn Glary, Glenn Roth, that's right, Eric, always be closing. The other thing that I think a lot of people said on the survey, and I'm seeing that come in from, it looks like Jamie, um, and then we can wrap up here, you guys, is, um, this idea of fanatical weekly forecasting meetings. And it fits a little bit into your weekly close plan, but I really do believe organizations who do this the most, do this the best, they got this maniacal focus every week. First, if they're a transactional business, every week, how are we closing deals? What are we doing to close that, man? Let's bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. If you're strategic, if you're relational, working with bigger deals, it's that, it's um, looking for the milestones maniacal focus, how we get into that next step, what are we doing to that next step, so that we're not caught at the end of month or quarter with in that position where we got to just, you know, drop everything and give the farm to get the deal. Again, guys, it's, you're, we're probably never going to be able to fix this completely. That's why I love Dr. Oldroyd saying, hey, look, number one, let's get talking about this. No one's ever quantified it. 27% revenue? you got to be kidding me. We're all dying to hit our quota, and because of what we're doing, we're messing up our ability to hit. So number one, we got to get the conversation, but I don't know. We're just starting to look at companies who are doing this differently because I'm telling you right now, as we've gone around and got feedback off this survey, every, this is a problem for everybody, guys, every single person. So Eric, Rick, <laughs> we got about 10 others who ask questions, but Eric and Rick, really appreciate your conversation. You better add me on LinkedIn, you guys. I'll be offended if you don't. Um, let's continue the conversation. 
I want to hear about your experiences when you take this report and run it on your own data. If you can't do that, I will offer free time from my team to help you figure it out because this is an important enough process. 27% is worth your time. So add me on LinkedIn. I'll be offended if you don't, or Facebook or Twitter. Let's continue the conversation. Download the report. Get the infographic. Let's make this thing viral and keep the conversation going. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day.